welcome everybody. Um, good morning from London and uh, good evening from Singapore. Uh, welcome to the um, final lecture in the Decolonizing Curating in the Museum in Southeast Asia um, series jointly run by the ACM uh, and the Southeast Asian Academic Art Program at SOAS University of London. Uh, my name is Stephen Murphy. I'm be your moderator tonight. I'm the senior lecturer in curating and museology at SOAS. And my co-organizer on the ACM side is Conan Chung, um, curator for Southeast Asia and the ACM. Just on a quick note, we started today's um, Zoom. We opened the Zoom room at uh, three minutes past 11, just in recognition that it is Armistice Day uh, here in the UK, where we recognize on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, um, the cessation of World War One in 1918. So just that is marked by a two minute silence here. So just in recognition of that, in case you were um, wondering why we opened at five past 11. Um, but today we have a double bill. Um, we have two lectures. Uh, they'll be by 20 minutes each. They'll be given by um, Professor Marika Blombergen and um, Dr. Mat Matilda, uh, Matilde uh, Meschling, um, and then the discussion will be moderated by Panga Ardianza. Um, the, today's talk is called uh, The Politics of Greater India and Indonesian Collections in Museums of Asian Art. Um, just before I get on to today's um, final lecture, I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, highlight some of the events that are coming up at both ACM and uh, SOAS respectively. First of all, of course, all of the lectures in this series have been recorded and are available um, on the Center for Southeast Asian Studies website at SOAS. So there's the link to that. Um, if you're interested if, in either watching this again or if you've missed some of the others in the series. Um, coming up in the, um, in the Center for Southeast Asian uh, Studies and the SOAS, Asian Art Academic Program. We run a yearly lecture series that's actually run by uh, Panga, who'll be the discussion discussant later. Um, and so that starts on December 2nd um, with a lecture on um, Khmer historiography under French colonial rule um, by Tara Tan from Kyoto University. So um, yeah, do look out for that if you're interested. Um, also at the Asian Civilizations Museum, they have an ACM Talks series sponsored by the Chris Foundation. And there's an upcoming lecture on 18th of November, um, the ambassador is spoiling us, gifts and material diplomacy at the courts of Siam and France at the end of the 17th century. So do look out for that as well. Conan is, uh, is moderating that one and uh, Giorgio Riello is the speaker. And oops, and then last but definitely not least, um, this is the Raffles Revisited um, publication that um, is the collection of essays um, from the conference we held at ACM in 2019. Um, it is literally going to print in the next week or so, I hope. Um, and we're hoping to have then a, 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 a virtual book launch, a roundtable discussion with all of the, or as many of the uh, contributors as we can get into one Zoom room. Um, so look out for that. We haven't got a date confirmed yet, but hopefully it will be um, just before Christmas or sometime early in the new year. Um, and again, it addresses, I think, a lot of issues that we're discussing in this lecture series as well, but through a very specific lens in this case. So um, on that note, I will just introduce today's two speakers. Let me stop sharing. Oh, actually, let me go back to that. And um, so we have um, first, first to speak for the first 20 minutes is uh, Professor uh, Marika Blumbergen. Uh, she's a senior researcher at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies and a professor in archival and post-colonial studies at Leiden University. Uh, her most recent monograph co-authored with Martin Ekhoff is The Politics of Heritage in Indonesia, A Cultural History, that's with Cambridge. Um, in her lecture, she dwells on her current book uh, project in progress entitled Indonesia and the Politics of Greater India, a Moral Geography, 1880s to 1990s. So we're very lucky we're gonna get a, a preview today of that. Um, the second speaker 
uh, Mathilde Meschling. She received her PhD in 2020 from University Sorbonne Nouvelle and Leiden University. Uh, her thesis, which she is currently adapting into a book publication, uh, focuses on Hindu and Buddhist bronze statuary from in the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, and she quickly engages with the legacies of colonial scholarship and developing an interdisciplinary methodology to study the bronzes. So without any further ado, I will hand the floor over to Marika. Let me stop. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to you and to Conan, for and to Mat Mathilde, actually, to get me in and to invite me to join this uh, uh, important lecture series, and to Panga for taking the time to react to both of us. So, let me start. In December 1947, and that was four months after Indian independence, the new Consul General of India in Batavia, then a recolonized city in the midst of the heated war between the Indonesian Republic and the Dutch, visited the Museum of the Royal Batavian Society of Arts and Sciences together with his wife and consulate staff. They came to see the archaeological collection. Notably, this museum is the predecessor of uh, what is now the National, National Museum in Jakarta in the same building. The consulate party was deeply impressed, as the consul wrote to the Dutch archaeologists that had hosted him, and I quote him, the museum unfolded itself as a pageant of a glorious civilization. In stone and metal and in clothing canvas, we discerned and realized the cultural, philosophic and artistic bonds between India and the people of these islands. In other words, the Indian consulate party had recognized Greater India in Java, and this, moreover, in the good care of a colonial institution. Along the same lines, but three years later, now in the formerly independent Republic of Indonesia, Prime Minister Nehru of India, in his first official diplomatic visit to Indonesia, climbed the famous 8th century Buddhist uh, shrine Borobudur uh, in central Java and thereby fulfilling a strong personal wish. Nehru considered Borobudur proof of an ancient greater Indian Hindu Buddhist civilization that, as he had learned from reading Indian poet Tagore and the Indian nationalist members of the Greater India Society, once had embraced the wider region of Asia, including Indonesia, and that emphasized the greatness of Indian culture. To Nehru, Borobudur served thus as an essentialized idea of Indian culture, which could now be of use of an anti-Western non-alignment policy. Talking about epistemic violence here might be an exaggeration, but it is clear that an Indonesian perspective did not interest Nehru very much. The visits of the Indian consul and Indian uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru recognizing to Java and recognizing remains of Java's Hindu Buddhist past as Indian reveal how and why sites transforming into heritage in colonial and post-colonial times and the related museums that were formed worldwide in around the same period are political. Important to note, what these visits also reveal, such sites connect to many histories and to moral geographies that have other boundaries than those of the state in which these sites, since the 19th century, became object of study and heritage formation. Not neutral, therefore, such visits to heritage sites are, especially when they take place during regime change. Now, this was all around 1950, but how should we understand a jubilant review of two blockbuster exhibitions taking place in a met Metropolitan Museum in New York in the 21st century, less than a decade ago, Buddhism along the Silk Road and Lost Kingdoms, Hindu Buddhist sculpture of Southeast Asia. Notably, in the prestigious journal, New York Review of Books, 
William Dalrymple, contemplating these shows, expressed his deep admiration in words that almost exactly mirror those of the Indian consul in 1947. For it is now increasingly clear, India during this period radiated its philosophies, political ideas and architecture over an entire continent, not by conquest, but by sheer cultural sophistication and summarized in the words, history is full of empire of the sword, but India alone created an empire of the spirit. The views of the Indian consul Nero and Dalrymple points to a continuity in the kind of greater India thinking that politically was most clearly embodied by this greater India society founded in Calcutta in 1926. Members of this society who would become influential in uh, post-colonial India's cultural politics were at the time much inspired by their reading of the work of French and later on Dutch colonial archeologists. They heralded the vision of a benign spiritual Indian civilization disseminating over Asia in the past and they propagated the study and revival of this civilization in the present. Now such explicit politicized greater Indian visions are part of a wider ph phenomenon with long lasting legacies worldwide that forms the central problem of my lecture today. Museums and galleries of Asian art, I argue, have done a great deal in shaping, disseminating and strengthening moral geographies of greater India. The question is not only how and why so, but also what are the implications of inclusion and exclusion of this way of looking at the world still today? And what is it that may make us all as scholars of Asia, aficionados of Asian art, pilgrims or tourists in Asia, or as readers of the New York Review of Books for that matter, complicit in viewing the Hindu Buddhist remains from Asia in that way and ignoring the political and the political effects of that view. In this lecture, I dwell on, on the findings from my present book project in progress on Indonesia and the politics of greater India thinking. In that book, I focus on the problem more widely. I look at the role of scholarly and spiritual knowledge networks from the Theosophical Society to the Hippie Trail and including ourselves in enabling the development of what I refer to as moral geographies of greater India. People's projections of moral ideas on the, re on the region that is today South and Southeast Asia, which they identify as one superior spiritual civilization with Hindu Buddhist characteristics and its origin in India, ignoring a predominant Islamic population the largest of the world, namely in Indonesia, but actually also in other parts of Asia. The image of greater India uh, and, and a greater Hindu Buddhist India lingers on worldwide. Not only do we find it in popular culture uh, and, and the yoga uh, popularity, but also in movies in which, uh, sorry, uh, Indonesia figures as a predominantly Hindu Buddhist country, but notably also and relevant for my lecture today in the world's most prestigious museums of Asian art. There we see how Indonesia again and again performs as the receiving part of an Indian Hindu Buddhist civilization and is absent in galleries of Islamic art. From the Metropolitan Museum in New York to Musée Guinée in Paris and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, well-choreographed exhibitions strategically, strategically use light and space to emphasize the spiritual power and inner beauty of Hindu and Buddhist statues, evoking ideas of greater India. In this way, they obfuscate the violence underlying how objects were collected, and they depict Southeast Asia as the passive recipient of a superior Indian civilization. So 
The question again is why do these moral geographies of greater India seem to dominate? How did they develop and why do they endure? Today, as a begin of explaining and as food for debate on the question whether and how we can decolonize that multi-centered world of greater India thinking, I will focus on what I call the charmed knowledge networks and friendships between Asia and the West in the world of museums and trades of Asian art that helped shaping these moral geographies. And inspired by the work of Leila Gandhi, I argue that we should focus on the role of love or affections across decolonization if we want to understand the appeal and strength of greater India thinking in the world. In this light, in a recently published article, I explored the social political life of some antiquities of Indonesia's Hindu, Buddhist and Islamic past, traveling around 1900 from colonial Indonesia to museums and private collections in Europe and the US. My first example is a set of Islamic steels of Sumatra, now on display in the Indonesian section of the Museum of Asian Art in Paris. Islamic, I hear you thinking, is that not contradicting my arguments? No, my answer is, it is the ex exception that proves the rule. Let us start at their site of origin and uh, in a moment, uh, later moment of their life in 1884 when in the midst of an ongoing war of conquest waged by the Dutch colonial army in Aceh on Sumatra and the Netherlands Indies, the French adventurer geographer Paul Falk visited an old and he apparently presumed abandoned Islamic graveyard near Kota Raja and took away three 14th century steels that he thought were wonderfully sculpted. He sent them to France as a gift to the Musée de Trocadero, which was just founded by the Ministry of Public Education. Accentuating the conventional self-image of the colonial archaeologist as a great discoverer of unknown and neglected ancient civilizations, Folk pictured himself at the graveyard, but provided no information as to the condition and on, as to the conditions under which he took hold of the Islamic steels. What had impressed him most was not necessarily their function, but rather their beauty or the aesthetic characteristics with which he could identify. He recognized in them a mix of, and I quote him, Hindu and Arab arts, which he thought exemplified the high level of taste among the ancient population living in, the, uh, in Aceh during, and I quote him again, the invasion of the Muslims in the Malay archipelago, which is situated in the 14th century. Thus, a selective aesthetic sensation of a French scholar adventurer, generating his love for the objects and his abducting them from their original sites, signed the curious fate of three ancient Islamic steels from Sumatra. They were transferred a number of times between various ethnographic museums in Paris, and on the way, they were elevated from the category of ethnographic artifacts to that of religious art. Since 1930, as such, they have been held by Paris, uh, by Paris Museum of Asian Art, Musée Guimet. There, due to their mixed Hindu-Arab Arab style, the Islamic steels were subjected to the dominant interest among scholars and collectors around 1900 in the external Indian civilizational influences in local Asian histories, as they still do today. At Guimet, in the Indonesian section, located between those of Burma and Vietnam, they are understood within the framework of Indianized Buddhist art from Southeast Asia, you see them in the, the background of this picture. My second example concerns some of the heads of the 504 Buddha statues that once overlooked Javanese rice fields from what was once their base and is their site of belonging, Borobudur. I looked into five Borobudur Buddha heads 
that like the Islamic steels turned up around 19 or just after 1900 in France, just before and in the midst of the high tide of Buddhist art trade. Some of them also ended up in Musée Guimet. One of them traveled to the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art. Not, it's not the one on display in this picture. That one did so with a rise in market price of around $1,700 within seven years. The social life of these Buddha heads provides insight into how changing taxonomies and valuation of the material remains of Asia's Hindu Buddhist past transformed these objects into arts of greater India and vice versa, or vice versa. For from around 1910, greater India thinking became pivotal to the inception of a new category of and theorizing on Asian art and the emergence of the Friends of Asian Arts movements and markets. To theosophists whom art critics of the time were crucial to that new appreciation of the Hindu Buddhist material remains of Asia for their aesthetic and Indian merits. Ananda Komaraswamy, born from Sri Lankan and English parents in Sri Lanka, who would become the first curator of the prestigious Indian section of the Bossa Museum of Fine Arts. And the other one was Ernest Havel, until 1906, superintendent of the Calcutta Government Art School. Both looked at artistic expression, expressions in Asia under the label of Indian art to be appreciated as high art in its own right and not as a derivative of Western, Greek and Roman standards. Asian art was superior to European art because in their eyes, it showed the Indian, capacity, Indian artist's capacity to conceptualizing the divine. In Havel's publications, one of Borobudur Buddha's statues from the north side served as a superb example. While this statue was located in Java, the art is Indian, concluded Havel. Now, the ideas of uh, Komarazwami and Havel have been extremely influential in the way the material rem uh, remains of the Hindu and Buddhist past of Asia are put on display in the world's most influential museums. But in the context of this inventive moment uh, around 1910 and the celebration of greater Indian art, as well as of Asia-based nationalism, from the 1910s onwards, cultural and economic elites in Asia, Europe, and the US began to engage with the new academic and private association, associational activities while self-identifying as Friends of Asian Art or Friends of Asia. These associations reflected a globally connected, powerful movement of greater India thinking that fed into colonial and inter-Asian and intercolonial networks of knowledge. Uh, I put some examples and listed on these slides. What matters here is how these associations firmly share the belief that the collection, study, and united display of Asia, an Asian red Indianized arts, and the contemplation of the civilization in which they could flourish would benefit the West and the East. It would be good both for empire and Asian nationalist self-esteem. The Friends of Asian Art were charmed and connected via their esteemed modern museums and associations in the US, Europe, and Asia. And it built on the trending theorization of Asian art as art of greater India. Their imagination became useful again after World War II and the formal independence of the formerly colonized countries in Asia. Thus, in the 1950s, the newly independent Republic of Indonesia once again became part and parcel of Art of Greater India exhibits, supported by Indian embassies in several places in the world. To all indications, for their curators, the categorization remained unproblematic. One such exhibit was held at the LA County Museum in 1950. Indonesia was re represented as Java and exclusively 
by ancient Buddhist objects from American collections. This exhibition and its cataloging and its catalog are enlightening for how moral geographies of Greater India can become etched in people's minds. First, the map that I already showed you, it was from this exhibition, which frames all objects on display. And next, the way curator Trubner defended the initiative. And I quote him, today, sincere efforts are being made to bring about closer relations between the East and the West. It is important that we attain knowledge of India's great cultural past and realize the tremendous role that country has played in the history of Far Eastern art. The immediate purpose of the exhibition is to bring about an unbiased and true appreciation of Indian art and a deeper understanding of India's great heritage. So much for the heritage of the other new independent nation states, states the borders of which were obfuscated on the map of Greater India and whose people were working at home in parallel on nation building through cultural politics. Ironic here is President Sukarno's December 1953 inauguration of the reconstruction of the 9th century Shiva temple at Pamanon, also in central Java, as Indonesia's first national monument. In the country's national museum, which you already saw, the Hindu Buddhist antiquities there emphatically tell the history not of India, but of Indonesia. Nonetheless, in museums outside of Indonesia, from LA to Calcutta, Amsterdam to Paris, Hindu Buddhist temple remains from Java still serve narratives of a greater India. And to stick to Indonesia, even the National Museum in Jakarta does not escape this fate. If we think of the example of the Indian Consul General with whom I started my talk. So, what has love got to do with all of this? The study and collection of Indonesian antiquities by the secret central in my paper was driven by love, inclusiveness, or motives of peace through cultural understanding. But their search also reveals the potential that love has to spawn epistemic violence and appropriation. The French adventurer, geographer, folk, informed by Western theories of civilizational progress, recognized a transformative civilizational moment in the Islamic steels in Aceh as beauty. The friends of Asian art, captivated by Komaraswami's and Hafal's theories, identified the Indian artist's capacity to visualize the divine in what were, to them, self-familiar images of a meditative man. Through this kind of self-understanding and through their network networks, their texts and object-based interpretations, sales and exhibitions, the Friends of Asian Art contributed to the global spread of moral geographies of Greater India. These moral geographies entailed exclusion, a steadfast blindness regarding Indonesia's predominantly Muslim population or those in other countries in Asia, which had so many other paths to identify with beyond those of Hindu Buddhist kingdoms labeled as Indian, Indianized or Indic. All these cases should warn us of the dangers and distortions that transpire from transnational, civilizational, conspatial framings of Asia or any other region as a homogenized and exclusive field of study. It also alerts us that grounding research and the collection of knowledge or objects as knowledge or art in sympathy or affection will not guarantee truer understanding of other people's cultures, histories, and memories. And I thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Marika. Uh, I'm going to continue this lecture. Let me share my slides.
here. So as a complementary uh, perspective to America's lecture, I'm going to focus on the impact of the greater India theory on the interpretation of Hindu and Buddhist uh, bronze statues from the Indonesian archipelago. I started um, my research on bronze statuary when I was doing my PhD, uh, and I did not start my project in a decolonial uh, perspective, but I prog progressively became aware of um, enduring ideas elaborated during the colonial period and in post-war study that still constrain the way we interpret these materials today. Um, for this lecture, I would like to reflect on a question that uh, Marike asked in one of her latest articles, which is why we must ask, is it still so hard to write about Southeast Asia or its subregion without starting with India? Uh, one of the most problematic way of interpreting Hindu and Buddhist archaeological remains uh, in Southeast Asia since the 19th century is to constantly see India as the source of artistic styles and iconographies which uh, in a unidirectional cultural flow would have reached Southeast Asia. And even if other big steps in decolonizing museums are undertaken, introducing Southeast Asia in terms of its contact with India still persists in many museum displays and catalogs. And bronze statues have always participated to this idea of India as a source. They are said to be lighter and more portable than stone sculpture, so they are traditionally being regarded as one of the main means through which Hinduism and Buddhism uh, styles and iconographies originally spread from India to Southeast Asia. And this is especially true for bronze statues found in the Indonesian archipelago and the Thailand Peninsula, because they show various styles that are also found in bronze statues found in India. Um, I'm going to trace the diverse interpretation of a group of four bronze Buddha statues um, to show you how, in some cases, the nature of a relationship with India can be reassessed. These statues were discovered across what is today Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam in the 1910s and 20s. And the distinctive style of uh, the monastic robe of these images, uh, with regular pleats and the right shoulder uncovered, was immediately associated with that of the Amarati School of Sculpture, located in the Andhra region of India. Scholars assumed that these bronze statues found in Southeast Asia uh, had been made in Amarati between the second and fourth century before having been exported to Southeast Asia. And these bronze statues were considered one of the earliest pieces of evidence for the Greater India theory proving an Indian colonization of Southeast Asia. And even when the concept of a political Indian colonization of Southeast Asia was abandoned after World War II, the idea of a cultural colonization endured. And for instance, this is palpable throughout the several edition of Georges Cedes, Indian United States of Southeast Asia, in his 1968 English translation, the so-called Amaravati Buddhas found in Southeast Asia continue to be considered of Indian origin and showing the farthest limits of Indian colonization in Southeast Asia. We see a shift in uh, interpretation in the interpretation of the so-called Amaravati Buddha found in Southeast Asia in an exhibition catalog published in 1971. They were then considered to have been carried by missionaries and pilgrims uh, to spread Buddhism. And this interpretation reflected ongoing scholarly debates, which for three decades focused on the Indian agents involved in the what was then uh, named the Indianization process. New, these new theories put a greater emphasis on the role of Indian religious masters traveling on the maritime routes with traders. So that is why these bronzes were interpreted as having traveled with missionary uh, Buddhists from India. Um, when I saw the Buddha found in Sulawesi uh, at the National Museum in Jakarta in 2014, the caption mentioned the possibility that this statue had been made in Amarati and then brought to Indonesia. 
And Panga mentioned to me that in 2017, the Indonesian Ministry of Education and Culture recognized this Buddha as the oldest bronze Buddha from Indonesia. And the statue acquired the national cultural heritage status. Uh, an article posted on the blog of the ministry explains that this Buddha is an evidence of Indian traders uh, passing in the region. And it is dated to the second to fifth century based on the Indian Amaravati style. So we see that the interpretation of this statue has not changed much uh, since its discovery in 1921. Yet other interpretations have been proposed. Um, for instance, uh, Pierre Edmonguin has identified the so-called Amaravati Bronze Buddha as one of the pan Southeast Asian families of religious statuary, which show the spread of a common artistic vocabulary and shared belief in Southeast Asia between the 5th and 7th, 8th centuries. The strength of this concept is to allow for an analysis of trans-regional uh, production of religion statuary within Southeast Asia and independent of trends with India. Um, however, the pan-Southeast Asian family are considered the, the Southeast Asian responses to Indian inputs. And the names used for them are still both borrowed from Indian dynasties or sites. So I still see this concept as somewhat problematic because it still perpetuates the misleading idea that uh, the Indian influence was the stimulus without which there would have been no response uh, and it thereby undermined the Southeast Asian specificities and developments. So no matter how much emphasis we put on localization and Southeast Asian specificities, we continue to think of India as the source. And I think there is a need to address the nature of the relationship with India. Uh, and the so-called Amaravati Buddha are a great example to um, show you how this can be done. So for the various interpretations uh, that I have summarized, uh, the assumption that Amarati would be the source for uh, these bronzes has never been questioned. The possible role of Sri Lanka, where a similar type of Buddha images has been found, you have two examples here on the right, has sometimes been mentioned. But Sri Lanka too has been integrated into the greater, greater India paradigm, and for a long time, its heart has simply been seen as an extension of of the Indian Amaravati school. Uh, so while there was und undoubtedly a school of stone sculpture at Amaravati and in the nearby region between the second to fourth century, there is no evidence that a school of bronze sculpture ever existed at the site during the same period or even later. Only a single fragmentary uh, bronze Buddha uh, was found at Amaravati and in the whole of India. Uh, other bronze Buddhas were found at Amaravati, but they are um, in a style that is different and is not specific from the Andhra region, so they may have come from elsewhere. And it is interesting because the portability of metal images found in Southeast Asia has consistently been stressed to remind one that their place of discovery was not necessarily their place of production. But surprisingly, this is rarely the case uh, for metal statues found in India. Uh, so while any Hindu and Buddhist object found in India is always assumed to be Indian and never to have come from elsewhere, this need not be the case, and especially for mobile objects. Since uh, the 19th century, more standing bronze Buddha with pleated robes have been found in Southeast Asia. And if we plot them on a map, like here, uh, together with the 13 bronze Buddhas known from Sri Lanka and the single Buddha discovered at Amaravati, we see that there is a larger number of these Buddha images found in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. So I really do not, do not see why the single uh, Buddha found at Amaravati could not have come from Southeast Asia or Sri Lanka. And while the cultural flow is overwhelmingly seen as one way from India to Southeast Asia, uh, it seems that it is also because of the way we interpret materials. Uh, while mobile objects such as bronze, with mobile objects such as bronzes, it is very difficult to give definitive answers about the direction of travel of objects or ideas. 
In addition to turning to India to trace artistic sources, um, art historians have traditionally relied on Indian materials to date Indonesian bronze images. However, Indian bronzes do not bear absolute dates, but would be inscribed on them, for example. And the dating is often based on their style uh, and are thus quite variable. So for instance, the so-called Amaravati bronze Buddhas have been dated between the second to fourth century originally, based on the school uh, of, of the Amaravati school of sculpture. But nowadays, they are more commonly uh, dated to between the 6th to 8th century, based on materials from India, uh, from Sri Lanka, sorry. Um, and in the 1988 Divine Bronze uh, Catalog, um, which is one of the only publications that attempted to understand the production of Indonesian metal images as a whole, um, this, this catalog has become the reference book uh, for Indonesian bronze images because it provided for the first time a chronology. Uh, and a great deal of emphasis was put on local innovations and development, which was innovative and placed the relationship with India in a more positive framework. However, the process of interaction was still seen as happening in two phases, with a first phase of imports from India and local copies, and a second phase when local adaptations developed more independently. So for the last part of this lecture, I will explain how we can depart from this idea of a production in two phase. One way to reassess all theories is to stop looking at bronze images simply as work of art. Uh, it is the status that these objects acquired when they entered museum collections. But bronze statues were originally conceived as religious images attached to specific cults. So instead of seeing connection between India and Southeast Asia in terms of artistic influences connecting sites, I prefer to see them as evidence of connections between people within religious networks. For instance, uh, I interpret the similar standing Buddhas with pleated rope found in Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka and Amarati as evidence of shared religious concept and common cults between communities of worship uh, in these regions. I propose in my research that the bronze Buddha with pleated robes were associated with images representing a specific type of ascetic bodhisattva, which have been found in the same region when they are mapped. Um, and these ascetic uh, bodhisattva share a similar style and fabrication technique in all three regions. And the Buddha and ascetic bodhisattva may have originally functioned within triads, that were worshipped for the protection of mariners. Such a cult uh, associating these two types of images is attested in Sri Lanka, that's the image here on the left, um, through extant stone uh, triads. And a Nepalese manuscript also illustrates such a triad, which would have been worshipped on the island of Java. Uh, so if we see the bronze statues in the context of different networks, it also becomes apparent that different groups of metal images have different um, production contexts, depending on the artisans who made them and the donors who participated in distinct networks. Therefore, different groups of bronze statues result from different processes of interaction. And one can imagine that there is no linear evolution from Indian models to local adaptation. Instead, some groups of images were perhaps made in cosmopolitan workshops, while others were not, but groups were nonetheless contemporaneous and local creations. An example of this is a group of around 80 bronze images. I put here only three uh, examples. Uh, so this, this group of images were found in the Western islands of the Indonesian archipelago, and they are made in a style that is not found elsewhere. Um, let me just quickly point out some of the stylistic elements that together make these images unique to Indonesia. And in my research, I explained that this style can be connected to central Java. Um, through some stylistic connection that are visible with Borbudo. There is um, an image here on the right. 
through the, the shape of the throne with this triangular um, backrest, which is also visible on the on the bronze. And while we all we always see connections with India, interestingly, these bronze images uh, also connection show connection with clay tablets found in China and Japan. Here it is an example from Japan. So here it is not a question of whether this style would have come from China or Japan because these clay tablets were also mobile objects. So we actually don't know where they came from, but they are interesting to show that um, this group of bronze images uh, in a local uh, style um, was also connected to materials found in other region. And based on different evidence, it is possible to place these bronze images in the mid 8th century, which would be partly overlapping with the Buddhas with pleated robes uh, that I have introduced earlier. So we see that these two groups of images, um, we see with these two groups of images that bronze statues were part of different networks and developments did not happen in two phases with Indian import first and local developments uh, only afterwards. So I'm going to conclude um, this lecture with this, and I hope you have enjoyed this presentation of art historical issues, which may eventually help in interpreting museum collection differently to depart from colonial legacies. Uh, our present knowledge of bronze statues in the Indonesian archipelago has largely been shaped by studies conducted in a museum context, uh, because the vast majority of publication dedicated to the topic our collection or exhibition catalogs. And we all know that uh, museum professionals sometimes have little time to consecrate to researching the museum collection. So archaeologists and art historians also have a, a role to play uh, to help decolonize museum. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you to Mathilde and Marike for two. Uh, yeah, fascinating and complimentary uh, lectures. Okay, I'm going to hand over to um, our discussant, uh, Panga Ardianza, who is probably no stranger to most of you. He's a PhD candidate at the History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS, University of London. Um, his main interest is on the afterlives and knowledge production of Hindu Buddhist materials in Indonesia. Um, and he has recently co-edited Returning Southeast Asia's Past, Objects, Museums and Restitution uh, with Louise Tithikog that was published by NUS Press in 2021. Panga, I can think of no better person than, than you to respond to this. So over to you. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And also uh, thank you, Marika and uh, Mathilde for such interesting lectures. Um, in giving response to uh, these two presentations, I'm going to start with, uh, with an Indonesian context. Then I will circle back uh, to the museum in the West. Um, my sincere apology if it feels sporadic uh, at times. Uh, nonetheless, it is my attempt to connect the discussion, uh, to connect into the discussion these two contexts, uh, or shall I say, the words of East and West. And I put that in quotation. And uh, to make my response uh, more tangible, I will share a couple of images with you. So how I can do this. Yeah, I hope you see the image uh, fine. If not, please let me know. So um, I'll start with uh, this uh, display at the Radia Pustaka Museum in Solo, Indonesia. And as you can read from the label uh, on the slide, uh, these are the replica of bronze arms of which the original have been reconnected with the body now at the National Museum of Indonesia in Jakarta. The statue was found in Wonogiri, around 50 kilometers south of Solo in 1855, upon which the body was brought to Batavia, then the name of Port Jakarta. Uh, even though I'm not really sure whether the body and the arms were recovered at the same time. Uh, they were reconnected in 1990 at the National Museum, hence the production and this is in this display of the replica in Radia Pustaka. My question then, why the needs to reconnect uh, and display the more complete statue at the National Museum? 
and not say Radia Pustaka, which is arguably closer to the found site. Putting security consideration aside, uh, what we witness here is the lingering impact of Greater India conceptions and the exaltation of Indian art in European and North American museums. In Indonesia, it has been generally accepted and presented without further consideration that the archaeology of Indonesia is evolutionary divided into prehistorical, Hindu Buddhist, Islamic, and colonial periods. Each period represents different and separate sets of material culture within which Indonesian culture is rooted and has developed over time. In particular, uh, the periodization implies a clear division between ancient Hindu Buddhist period uh, produced between uh, 4th and 15th century and the early modern Islamic period between 16th and uh, 18th centuries. The period of Hindu Buddha is understood as and often used interchangeably with the term classical. Uh, in particular, based on the perceived imagination of this period as the golden age. When the highly regarded classical is put as the opposite of Islamic period, this process implicitly, yet almost automatically, renders Islam as medieval. It imagines Islam as the period of decline and thus lower down the history, historical hierarchy we assume that medieval represents a dark age. And it is by using this context of Hindu Buddhist art that we can better understand the conceptual development of local genius in the archeology span of Indonesia, developed from uh, probably in 1970s and arguably crystallized in the 1980s. With local genius, Indonesian argue that it was the locals that actively seeks and selects appropriate elements from Indic cultures to be adapted with the already thriving individu indigenous cultures in the regions that now become Indonesia. And this is where the archeology span of Indonesia become a useful tool to support the construction of national history. In a nutshell, this history put the rooting of Indonesian nation in the golden age period of Hindu Buddha thus the need to give more prominent agency to the past Indonesian community and away from the drive of greater India, thus the concept of local genius. Uh, Amir Sutarga was the director of the National Museum of Indonesia in the 1960s and 1970s. In 1971, he wrote a preface to the exhibition of Japanese sculptures in Asia, in Asia Society, New York, which is the same exhibition catalog shown in Mathilde's presentation earlier. Sutarga so said, and I quote, it is hoped that the exhibition will help to develop a lively regard for the arts of Indonesia, and especially for those that existed before the colonial period. These beautiful works are the creation of a free people only a free people has the capacity to unveil its creative ability, skills, and talents, and can enjoy unhindered the right to express and interpret its highest principle. He then further stated, and then I quote him again, it is a mistake to say that Indonesian culture was based only on foreign cultural influences. On the contrary, the Indonesian people developed their own culture, building on a foundation that has existed as early as the Neolithic period or the prehistoric period. This culture was not the result of a colonial process, but was the Indonesia's own achievement. So going back at the replica on the slide, what I have discussed is the meta narrative justifying the display of a more complete Avalokiteswara statue from Wonogiri in the National Museum of Indonesia in Jakarta. Standing, standing just less than a meter tall, the statue can be regarded as the masterpiece of Indonesian Hindu Buddhist art. This process shows the modern appropriations of an ancient, Hindu, an ancient Buddhist image 
of which the local perspective countering the greater India paradigm is conceived using a nationalist sentiment. It is the appropriation of the of which the so-called East or West in terms of knowledge production is not really clear. And in that sense, knowledge ultimately comes out of interactions between multiple agencies and approaches. Next, I would like to divert our attention to the VNA in London. Here we have the plaster cast of Borobudur reliefs made in 1930s, and it has been discussed uh, vastly by in the Marikas books, in one of the Marikas as well. Now on display at the Buddhism Gallery at the VNA. It is accompanied by this fancy label, A Catchingly in Dual Scripts, English and Japanese. You can see the Japanese script on the right side of the label. It seems to me that this curatorial intervention is an effort to move away from Greater India paradigm and is set up to resituate the objects in its spatial origin. Spatial origin. It is a laudable act and needs to be appreciated. Nonetheless, my problem with this labeling is that at the same time, it also feels like a grand gesture, but meaningless beyond that. Almost no one in London can actually read or even recognize that this label is written in Japanese scripts. Or maybe there's a guessing that the script may be Japanese by association. It is also not lost that the script used in the label uh, the Japanese script used in the label is a modern one, uh, conceived in the early 20th century. Borobudur was built in the 9th century, and Java arguably had a different script at that point in time, of which it was carved into some of the stone in the temple of Borobudur. So this brings me to uh, two broader questions about ways to move forwards, which I would like to ask to uh, Marika and Matil as they also relate to the lecture as well. First, um, it has been said frequently that to decolonize is to foreground the local voice. Marika mentioned in her recent article about local memories and Matil talked about local creation and variation in her presentations. So to you both, how should we approach the lo this local voice while at the same time being aware that there are multiple local voices even for an object? That in the local, there are different agencies in different temporalities which were or are also at play. That local may not be country specific whose boundaries are delineated in modern time. And that in the end, we do not end up essentializing the local. And my second question, uh, which is also related to my first question, is that within a museum context, how should we define uh, the local, national, regional, transnational interactions, both in the production of the object itself and its knowledge today? Marika has warned us that we should couple affections with critical engagement. And Matthew has moved away to see the bronzes not only as a work of art. So in other words, I'm asking about what kinds of knowledge co-productions or what kind of, of what kind of new term probably that could transcend the modern hierarchies of the type of knowledge and use which structures the interpretation of an objects, as well as to move beyond the false binary of East and West, us and other. And I'm not sure we're gonna start first. So maybe Marika, you wanna start first? Yeah, thank you. Wow, oh, these are, I think, uh, the core of the problem. Oh, um... One moment. Okay, sorry, there was something uh, on my screen from the host of the seminar. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you for for the the interesting um, 
uh, perspective you give by uh, connecting to what is happening in Indonesia and where, where you see also um, these politics of a central central uh, centralization of a story uh, preventing local engagements with uh, objects found in, in, in the local area, which actually also goes back to colonial times where you see a similar debate going on. Um, so I, I would like to say more on that, but I first try to answer your questions. Uh, indeed, like, like I, I didn't do it that much in my lecture, but in my article, I reflect uh, on, on the idea of local memories being silenced uh, in, in museums. But um, uh, emphatically, I, I talk about memories and, and the whole idea of the, the article is that not only Greater India is an essential, uh, Greater India thinking has an essentializing effect, but the way we think of a local perspective is, is also problematic. You see it in the Friends of Asian Art Museum, but um, as I discussed in my article, there is a long uh, debate going on, going back to the colonial times against greater Indian thinking, where you see this um, notion of local genius coming up. Um, um, and, and which is for some archaeologists like the Dutch archaeologist Stutterheim, much inspired by um, historians criticizing of the, the thinking about the middle ages in the West. So you, at that time you had a famous book uh, by Huizinga um, uh, on, on the, the waning of uh, the Middle Ages, which describes, uh, tries to look in a different way at the Middle Ages as a, as a period of uh, regression. Um, and precisely that notion of local genius you see indeed come up again uh, in, in, in uh, the work of uh, Indonesian archaeology, in, like you say, in the 1970s and the 1980s. So it is a very good point. It's actually, actually we should start by problematizing this this thinking of a, a local a local perspective, and if if we want to make a difference in museums, I also think you know, Matilda gave some very good examples. Is is the, at least try to stay, say it's tell many different stories that could, could be about the life of these objects uh, that in the time Matilda discusses. But also, it, it is not only about the, their history there. Um, we should also tell the stories, uh, their experience in the, the, the trajectories they had when they traveled from wherever they were made, if we know where they were made, to other places in the world and uh, try to tell both the painful stories they experience um, and, and don't, um, I, I think art historical categorization, um, I think Matilda can better take over from here, but um, there is a problem of essentializing in itself. Um, uh, just by by naming a period, uh, a re uh, the name of giving it the name of a region, there we already have have a problem. It's what you see in Indian museums. The history of India is actually taught by um, progressive styles of art, which are actually um, very um, what is this? Willkürig, uh, very uh, uh, selective. Uh, so maybe I should just first um, stick to your first question and give give the word to Mat Mathilde, otherwise I talk too long. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, I think you already introduced, um, I mean, about these categories that are essentializing. And I think in what I discussed, the Amaravati uh, Buddhas, I mean, the fact that this uh, single Buddha found at Amaravati was actually classified in this larger school of sculpture from Amaravati between the second to fourth century is quite typical of the kind of um, 
categories uh, that have been created during the colonial period where all the materials have been, we have been trying to fit all these material in like these very strict uh, categories uh, which were often based on on dynasties actually even though the objects were not necessarily commissioned by um, by kings or rulers uh, but we have put these uh, objects into dynastic uh, categories and I think today there is a need to reassess that and to reassess what we really know about the objects because sometimes I feel like we are trying to um, tell too much um, I mean you know use the objects to tell too much and um, the stories we are creating are very speculative and there is definitely a problem in, um, I mean, Southeast Asian art, I've mentioned it, that there is this view of two phases of development with first things coming from India and then local developments to try to counter this greater India thinking. Um, but this is also yeah, very essentializing. And I think um, one way to depart from that is if, uh, because museums try to um, present broad narratives so that the audience can understand uh, historical development. Uh, but this is also what was done during the colonial period. The, the point of museum was to present these broad uh, stories about human developments. Uh, I think today museums can try to um, be more specific to present case studies, for example, of objects and to, to try to tell uh, more diverse stories and not these broader narratives. And I think, I mean, that's what I've been trying to show in the, in the lecture with this group of bronzes, but they have been put in this like very strict uh, chronology. But actually, if you look at the material, it's very hard to date them. It's very hard to know where they have been made. And the boundaries of modern nation states don't really apply to these materials. They were found in multiple regions. And so the idea of foreign and local, does it really apply? Because we don't really, um, it's hard to define, I think. And um, that's something to think about <laughs> maybe a bit more. Great, thanks. I realize, Panga, do you mind if, have you got a response to it or will we go to, there's quite a few questions that are in the Q&A, but Panga, if you want to respond first, that's fine. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I will agree to uh, quote's answer and uh, I just want to add that, um, yeah, I mean, the, the museum or even the, 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 the field of archaeology, well, I'm speaking, speaking in the context of Indonesia is also uh, uh, I would actually focus on when interpreting objects would focus on the uh, original time of constructions uh, and they don't see uh, that meaning changes that the story created with the objects over time, after life, uh, after uh, the production as well. And yeah, I think some of the uh, answer relies on the approach that has been taken by Marika, especially the object biography. Uh, we could uh, expressly do that, but again, I don't know if that will be uh, tangible in the futures because even like even with the with the bronze images or bronze objects, is even uh, from one side, one pound side, we found images scattered around the different museum, uh, different uh, countries, different uh, location, and sometimes the 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 origin. The information about the origin got lost in the transfers, and uh, the, the the curator or the, the the scholar would interpret that maybe differently from when we when we know that they they came from the same one side. So, yeah, I think that's my response to that. Maybe you answer, you want to take question from the audience? Yeah, I think because yeah, we've probably, we've got quite a few coming in. Actually, first of all, I. Uh, Imran was the first to pose a question, so I'll ask that in a moment, but um, Himanshu Prabhare has made more of a comment, but actually it sort of ties in with, I think, what you've all said. So, you know, again, she thinks that um, there's a need to 
decolonize knowledge production through art styles. So I think, again, what we're getting at as well is, it, of course, it's not just museums, but it's the discipline of art history that, you know, the museums and art history, of course, go hand in hand. We, we can't separate them. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's, again, these changes or these reformalizations need to need to take place within how we teach, you know, again, because obviously if we're, if we teach in this certain way, then of course the, the, the generation, the next generation of curators will also curate in that, in that way as well. So I think that's probably, yeah, it's a larger, it's a larger picture. Um, Imran has, has quite a, actually about two or three questions, but maybe I'll try and summarize them more for, um, for Marak, Marika. Um, he wants, he asks if you could um, enlighten us as to whether any Indonesian scholars um, have challenged the greater Indian narrative um, and what have they said about Java's position in the wider Pan-Asian circuits of Indic Buddhist and Hindu art. And then um, he also asks how you would position the work of French, uh, of Du Marseille and also the Japanese scholar um, Chihara in their narration of the Indic art of Java. Um, and then finally he asks, um, might there be a preferable alternative term? Um, do you think Indic is a better term? But anyway, he looks forward to your book. So there's, <laughs> there's lots there too. So maybe you could just sort of talk um, I don't know if you want to answer the first part of it, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, um, well, in the field of uh, archaeology, I think we have a great Indonesian scholar uh, amongst us who, who, uh, who, who shows a very um, uh, critical and, and nuanced uh, reaction to this greater Indian narrative in, in itself. Uh, um, during my research for the, my, the previous book with Martijn Eikhoff, uh, we had, and also actually for my present project, I had several discussions with all, older generations of archaeologists, some of them who were trained in colonial times and were also aware of this discussion. So they, they may have also played a role in why this local genius idea became so popular again in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, but I, I also know that they were uh, part and parcel of this world of uh, um, South and Southeast Asian archaeology art and archaeology um, conferences, often uh, organized in Indian context. And there, even if they would tell that local genius perspective on uh, Indonesian's ancient history, it would end up in a, an edited volume that tells a greater Indian perspective. And uh, I don't know if you remember, I had a, a one final slide uh, in my presentation and I decided, well, may, well I, I, I skipped that part. But one of the archaeologists I spoke with was uh, Mundar Gito. Um, he was on a picture and he was a very young archaeologist who, uh, um, when Indian archaeologists in the 1950s visited the sites and they would have this kind of discussions. And when I asked him about, well, don't you, don't you have a problem with that? And he laughed and he said, well, um, we always would answer. We had, we had our own culture before you came. Uh, and then he said to me, uh, uh, and they, didn't they, the Indians, didn't colonize us uh, with a laugh. So well, obviously there, there is, but there is also a, a, a hierarchy and power relations in the way of academic production that you see reflected here and, and, and also see changing uh, right now. So that is good. Um, yeah, and about okay, uh, the, 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 the Japanese archeologists, they are actually in, in the book I wrote about uh, with Martijn Eikhoff, um, uh, Chihara. Yeah, it's an interesting figure uh, for several reasons, but he, he follows that perspective and he was also enamored by Southeast Asia's Hindu Buddhist culture and, and trying to seek the Japanese connections with it. So there are, of course, there are various moral geographies of a greater Asian Buddhist, Hindu Buddhist culture with that, which have different centers. There's also a Simon center, a, a Buddhist 
a revivalist way of looking at it. Um, yeah. So is that maybe we won't we don't have much time. Uh, is that okay or you want more? Yeah, no, I think that's fine. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um he, he can read your book anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's great. Um I want to go on to the next question um from Azam Cesar. Um the National Museum of Indonesia is currently doing a massive refurbishment of one of, of one of which is to create an Islamic art gallery gallery strategic, strategically positioned to be near the museum's courtyard that have Hindu and Buddhist art. How should a museum display their Indonesian religious art to try to detach themselves from the greater Indian narrative to display Islamic, Hindu and Buddhist art together to show their geographical similarity or to display them in separate galleries according to the religious traditions that produce them? Yeah, a very good question about, you know, actual which I think you both talked about anyway, about the, this, you know, this false dichotomy actually between Hindu Buddhist Java or Hindu Buddhist Indonesia and, and Islamic um, Indonesia, which gets reinforced and, and perpetuated in not just how museums um, narrate the story, but actually how museums are structured, right? How the actual um, layouts and where the objects are, are, which departments these objects fall into. So yeah, I don't know, do, do, do one of you want to take that question? Um, it's quite a, a museological one. Mathilde, you want to? Yeah, I was thinking about the fact that the Hindu and Buddhist uh, images, I mean, sculptures or other archeological remains, they are always used to talk about the Hindu Buddhist period. But actually, um, in case of the bronzes, some of them were found in uh, family heirlooms uh, when they were found during the colonial period. So they were um, still worshipped by um, families who were Muslim, even though these images were originally Hindu and Buddhist. So in a way, the, the context into which these images had been created uh, didn't matter. These objects were still considered sacred and were still worshipped. And that is something that is not, I mean, I've never seen in a museum. So I think Hindu and Buddhist images could also be discussed in the context of uh, Islamic belief to show how, um, in a way, religion, I mean, this separation between religions or period are not always relevant to the life of the object because an object had multiple lives. May, if, may I add? Absolutely. Uh, uh, in, in addition to that, I, I think uh, that is indeed the, 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 the problem is larger, uh, like Stefan says, uh, uh, about the way museum, museums categorize and, and fix uh, certain ideas, uh, not only what um, national history is about, but also what culture is about. And uh, uh, so I wonder if it's a good, good idea in principle to, to organize it according to religion. It's, yeah. Mm. Actually, there's a, there's a follow-up question really by Sujata. Um, who asks, I think, and again, she's asking about um, objects of the indigenous cultures of various Indonesian islands. So again, how are they framed in Asian art museums, both local and overseas? Because there's those different, you know, cultural groups as well. So, you know, it's not just Hindu, Buddhist and Islamic, there's also, uh, so yeah, I, have, we haven't discussed that today, but does anyone want to respond to that as well? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I'm, I'm, I would argue that I mean it, it, it is true uh, they are often in in a in a separate gallery in museums they are often part of the oceanic world but not always and there are examples of museums and definitely exhibitions from the 1950s uh, the group of, of Heine Geldern uh, um, that that generation who organized exhibitions uh, uh, right after Indonesian independence also selected these these core bars uh, and and uh, the, well, objects from from other cultures or other cultures and i would say they they were uh moved by these objects for 
quite the same reasons as they were moved by a, a Buddha head, because of the spiritual uh, value or, or the divine they they sensed or projected on these kind of objects. So they they were situ and and are if you go to Musée uh, Cabrini, still situated in this idea of of, um, of a spiritual Asian culture. But maybe indeed it, it is hard to to look, to connect it to India for some of the so it's it's another um, yeah moral geography that overlaps with the greater Indian ID. Uh, can I add to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know if you mean. I mean, I don't know by indigenous culture you mean also. Uh, tribal arts from 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 uh, islands of in, in the archipelago the archipelago of Indonesia outside Java or Sumatra, and um, to answer to 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 answer that, then in the overseas museum, I don't know if they would be they would enter the art museum because they will be presented in the ethnography museum. Uh, more into it, ethnographic collection and display as well. Um, in the National Museum, which is uh, in, in Jakarta, uh, the National Museum of Indonesia, this is also very interesting um, changing of interpretation of, of this uh, uh, indigenous arts. Uh, in the corner, uh, Catherine McGregor already wrote about this, uh, I think 10 or 10 years ago, uh, that, um, they were collected in the colonial periods uh, by the Dutch to show the the, uh, the the collection of the outer islands of, of the colony and then the, the variation of in, in the colony. But then when the Indonesia got their independence in the 1940s, uh, the National Museum changed the narrative to show that this ethnographic uh, collections shows the unity and in, in diversity uh, the, that Indonesia consists of of, of, of diverse community, but they are, we are united under the banner of Indonesia. So we see the appropriation of, of that ethnographic collection in the National Museum as well. Thanks. Um, if you don't mind, we'll keep going. Um, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to keep going for at least another, maybe 10 minutes just to get the last few questions answered. And um, I just want to jump down to um, a question by Shuban. This was, so I'll get back to the two in a minute because I think it still relates to this, what we're talking about. And it's something I think that we all maybe <laughs> have to keep in mind that, of course, um, both presentations rightfully highlight how the greater India society is crucial to form the backbone of the Indocentric views for Southeast Asian past, disregarding like the Muslim presence in the region. But can the Indian influence be totally disregarded? Surely not. And I think, I mean, this is where it does get a bit. This has always been the debate, right? The, the, the sort of push and pull between um, the colonial narratives that, oh, I guess, overemphasize the importance of India or the greater India. And then there's maybe with the post-independence movements in Southeast Asia, sort of a rise of Indi uh, nationalism, then a sort of maybe overemphasis on the local genius. And so, yeah, I just wonder where you all position yourself on that. How do we get the sort of the balance right? Because of course we can't disregard India as well, right? But uh, uh, yeah, or maybe we can. I don't know. So that's that's a question for the two of you. Well, first of all, um, India uh, wasn't wasn't India uh, before it became a colonial construction. Sorry, I'm sorry to. I mean, it, it, the, the so that that's for that's already for one reason makes it highly problematic uh, to to stick so I thank you for closing me Matilda on this question why why should we why why can why can we not get rid of it uh, um, I mean we the uh, one one solution uh, also in, in in terms of history writing and the problems of sources we have, uh, how we can get uh, away from a Western-centered framework of writing history, at least start where the story 
in your eyes uh, starts. You jump in. Um, the moment you start reflecting on, surely there must be influences from that region that we call now uh, India, because maybe there were monks traveling and etc. Um, you take away. But you, you can yeah you can always start there but you can, why why wouldn't you start uh, in the circles of knowledge production that Matilde is talking about the smaller so I yeah I I don't see uh, any necessity to reflect on that question anymore uh, we have had enough of that hi Matilde do you want to add or not yeah, okay. No, I agree with Marika, and yeah, India was not India at that time, so if we see, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't speak about the Indian influence, because influence means that there was one region that was superior to the other, um, so I, I think I would speak more in terms of relationship, maybe, and, um, and then if we see connections with what is today India, we have to see exactly which region in India uh and try to understand this relationship not see it simply as an influence or an import from india to to southeast asia so that's one way of problem i mean yeah to like look at things a bit differently sure um we're all we're sort of out of time but i just want to get to mylin's question as uh, the last one sorry faisal we won't be able to get to yours today um but so again for Mathilde, um, she says, uh, I would like to ask if archaeometric analysis would help with the bronzes apart from stylistic ways. Um, I presume she means in terms of where they're being produced. Um, uh, yes, I, I mean, in my PhD research, I have been integrating some uh, archaeometallurgical um, technical analysis on the bronzes, so to study more about fabrication techniques and also about the materials, um, especially the, the different metal uh, alloys. And um, this does not give definitive answer. I mean, I haven't been studying a lot of images. I have uh, been studying the collection of the Musée Binet, which is around 40 uh, pieces, and then I have included some more at the uh, museum in Leiden. Um, so I think in total I studied a hundred uh, pieces, uh, but where the metal was analyzed, and I also looked at the fabrication techniques. And it is possible to see um, interesting results, but always in combination with uh, stylistic elements and iconographies, and um, and I think in the future, if we conduct more uh, research, we could be able to um, give have more answers. But about where exactly the pieces were made, that is very difficult to, to answer these questions because uh, we cannot always trace the materials where they were uh, taken. And also we don't have any um, bronze casting workshops that has been found in archaeological excavation. So we also cannot try to identify remains from a casting workshop to try to see if the composition is the same as some statues. So to identify where a statue exactly would have been made. So it is a work in progress. And uh, maybe in the future, we can, we can try to have more answers about that. Thank you. Yeah, important question. Um, I think on, on that note, I'll bring this to a close. I'm sorry to there's a, one or two other questions that we and comments coming up that we didn't get a chance to to answer. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank um, obviously our two speakers today, um, Professor Marco Blumbergen and Dr. Matilda Meschling, and of course Panga for his. Um, is very thoughtful and thought provoking response. Um, I also, because this is the last lecture uh, in the series, myself and Conan would just like to um, make a, give a, uh, express our gratitude and thanks to all of the speakers um, who, who con and discussants who contributed to this, to making this um, series, I think really uh, thought provoking and um, interesting debates that we've had over the past six weeks. I think that I've really tried to get to answer questions of what it means to decolonize 
the museum, uh, Southeast Asian uh, history or historiographies in general. So, and of course, last but not least, to everybody in the audience, there's been really great audience turnout every week and the questions have been really um, stimulating and, and help to not just um, encourage the debate, but challenge it at times as well and, and challenge our own thinking. So thank you for that. So yeah, on that note, I will draw this to a close and just say thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.